Hello, and welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and you're listening to episode 137 with Callan Green, ACS and ZCS, DP of the TV show, The Gentleman. Enjoy. It is funny that like when you, when you start working, that's actually, let's turn this into a question. How do you, how do you balance like trying to, um, continue to absorb stuff with how much work you're doing? Cause you got a shit ton of like music videos and commercials on you too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, it's pretty tricky. I mean, having a, having a kid, um, and working as much as, as you do when you're doing TV drama, like you're pretty much doing 14 hour days straight all the time and you're pretty ruined by the weekend. So that we sit down and we watch something every now and again, but to be honest, I just kind of chill. I just sort of absorb by sort of osmosis when I can. Uh, sure. Talking long sets generally pretty good too, but yeah, we, uh, it's kind of takes a back seat. Well, at the moment, anyway. Do you find that that, um, you know, with how fast production is these days do you find that you need to keep up with what's I, i'm kind of taking more of the angle of like your commercials and stuff like that and music videos like yeah. do you find that you need to kind of keep up with what's trending or does that kind of just come in the brief usually and you do what, research to be honest you get a lot of that from instagram just saying what like you know i'm gonna try the kids knock at them 44 or something so it's just, you know what? Yeah, like a bit of that. I definitely keep an eye on like what technology is going on with lenses and stuff like that. Um, also different remote heads and ways of moving the camera. But um, generally, um, just from each job and the research I'll put into each job, you tend, you tend to learn quite a lot, definitely more than I would like before, uh, during a job anyway. Yeah. Did you ever end up uh, buying those Illumina primes? Oh, right. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, God, I was keen on that for a while. Man, I used to own so much cash, eh? and then I sort of sold it all and then bought a house. So I got a little bit more onto it. Although it did me well for a while. But it was mainly when I was shooting in London. Uh, but then I started shooting car commercials overseas, and you can't really take kit with you. It was just sitting in a box, being expensive, and hanging out oh, yeah. and duck. It's fucking crazy how, like, what feels like five years ago, there was yeah. six lenses. Oh, and totally. the past two years, there's like a hundred. Yeah, there's a million billion lenses. They they're coming out like almost every day. It's like it's mad. I think I I've, I've realized TLS even made their own like set of lenses. TLS Vega. Maybe they've been around for a while, but I saw that yesterday. But um, yeah, there's there's just so many options, and some of them are pretty cool, man. I mean, Greg Fraser tends to lend, use quite a few of the uh, of the prototypes of a lot of these lenses, and they look fucking awesome. Yeah. I really like the, uh, not a sponsor, but, uh, the Nisi primes, <laughs> the which one, sorry, the Nisi cinema primes. They're like, oh, right. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I saw them at uh, CDP the other day. Like they're nuts. Eh? Just little tiny, little nano, nano lenses. Yeah. yeah. Chuck it on a three pro or something like that and whip it around on FX three and you're good to go. Yeah. The, I was talking to, uh, I saw them at, um, Cinegear you know, over on yeah. the Paramount lot. And, yeah. uh, the only, they warned me cause I have a C 500 and they were saying I, they might need, or, um, I guess Matt Duclos was saying that, uh, I should wait to like use them or buy them or whatever. Cause the reason they're yeah. so small is cause that PL mount sticks out really far. And if you have, right. uh, internal NDs that come down. Yeah. You can scratch to get them a scratch, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always a problem with it. <laughs> you definitely want to check in on something less expensive stuff, stuff right? <laughs> I would, when I was looking you up, I found your uh, blog spot. First of all, somehow I'm still logged into Blogspot. I, that's scary. Where the hell is that? It's on Blogspot, dog. Your uh, your anamorphic 5D website is still there. Oh my god, that is like so long ago. Oh, yeah, man. But yeah. The, uh, I kind of wanted to talk about that because because uh, that was. 14 years ago? Yeah, a long time ago. I got well into that. I was, I, I, I used to have a set of Lomos. Right. And they, they chucked them on my 5D that I had PML, uh, PL mounted, and that was, that come out with some awesome images. Yeah, there's all, unfortunately, the most of the, all the pictures are gone, but there was the link to that one website or the uh, music video. All right. And it's shocking how good that still holds up. Yeah. The man, 5D man. Mark II, like when uh, there's yeah. so much anxiety about what camera, you know, should I buy an FX3? Uh -huh. Should I buy? And it's like, dude, you can get a used 5D and it'll still look good. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of like shooting on print film or reverse film or something, right? But if you get it right, it's awesome. Yeah. What was the, uh, what spurred you? It's just so interesting to me because like that whole blog, we don't have got to recount the whole thing, but like, um, seems reading it now seems kind of quaint, but at the time was yeah. not, not an easy task to like PL mount to 5d and like rig it yeah. up and everything when today that's pretty standard. Yeah, it's pretty normal. Yeah. Luckily there was this like kind of, um, magician dude that lived in Melbourne. I was living in Sydney at the time. And he uh, was into doing all that kind of stuff. So I sent, uh, sent my 5D down to him and he ripped the guts out of it and stuck a PR mount on it. And then I was able to put my um, my Lomos on it. It was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. What kind of made you want to do that at the time? I had a I had a D90, so I was just on oh, five from day one. <laughs> That's not good. I suppose I was, I was in this uh, kind of time in my career where I sort of soon, uh, soon after leaving film school, I wasn't really like smashing it, but I could, I could definitely shoot. So I needed to have a, a kind of a bit of a niche and the 5D Mark II coming, coming out really, really helped me actually. I was kind of, I was known as the 5D guy in Sydney for a while, I think, uh, which is awesome. And it pissed off a lot of people because you rock up with your own kit and you're a lot cheaper and it's, if you can do the job, then it's wicked, right? Yeah. Um, just wanted to make it even even better, really. Just wanted a way of, of it being even more cinematic or more interesting or something, another feather in your 5D bow, you could say. Yeah. What, uh, it's, again, it's, it's just interesting to me because, like, the dichotomy, I grew up around that. I'm 33. So, you know, it was when I was in college that yeah. came out my, like, freshman year. And um, growing up, or like learning 16 millimeter, getting digital tools, you know, like a 5D, or we were on a DVX 100, but, um, or my XL2, but trying to make things, as you said, cinematic yeah. when you didn't have film was, yeah. um, difficult. <laughs> yeah. So I'm kind of wondering, like at the time, what were the things that you think made a cin cinematic image as opposed to maybe something today that, uh, seems to have right. done the trick? Or is it but, the same set of tools? Uh, it's pretty similar, but I suppose it was just cheaper and more uh, uh, you know, available to me. So I, I'd, I'd say the fact that it was large format. It was, right? It was large yep. format? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So therefore, you got a super shallow depth of field. Uh, Which at the time was not easy to do. Sensors. No, it wasn't. Pencils. Yeah, yeah. And I remember spending about two grand on some crappy monitor um, to be able to pull focus, but it paid off. It's a nightmare if you're going off the back of the camera. Um, uh, yeah, I suppose it's just, just that and then be able to put on a bunch of lenses and and, and the way it looked, it did kind of, if you got it right, look a bit kind of print cell in yeah. the right light. It needed a bit of contrast, but also uh, soft as well. It, it's, uh, did you end up selling the Lomos? Because those are very much back in fashion. Ah, uh, mate, yeah, look, let's not talk about the kit that I've sold. I used to, I had a full set of super speeds plus a 65 mil as well. And it's like, ah, uh, dude, uh, it makes you want to cry. But, uh, yeah, I did. I sold them to my mate. Uh, I've got pretty good cash for them, to be honest, because I think I bought them for about 20 grand. I sold them for 80,000 Aussie. Damn. So, yeah, it was good. Get me going. Get the, get the doors open. That's a funny, like, I asked... Uh, kind of, uh, I suppose, a mentor of mine when I was getting started, like, hey, should I, I you know, I was, I wanted to be a DB. And uh, I was like, should I buy lenses or camera? Because everyone was saying buy lenses because it's like yeah. an investment. And he was like, do not listen to them, buy a camera. And I was like, why? And he goes, oh, at yeah. your level, are you going to rent? And I was like, yeah. that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. No, owning lenses is wicked. I, I really miss owning kind of like my babies, but they're gone now. I also owned an F65. I had the first Sony F65 in Sydney, and that was that ended up being a really bad idea because just it was way too powerful for how it was way too good for how people knew how to use it. Like we'd shoot something and send it into the um, into the post house, and they'd just treat it like a, a Lexa Classic, and it was it would just come out like German gun footage from the 40s, and there were no blending. Like <laughs> just they just didn't tick the box with Sony, right? Or you know. And also, there's a lot of data. Well, and then I saw on that blog that you switched to a red one after all all was said and done. Was that uh, easier? <laughs> uh, no, I think that was because I could borrow my mate's one. Uh, yeah, the first 
time I used the red one, we had to put a um, ice pack on it, and it kept shutting down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, I knew, what was the one after the red one? Was it the? the, the it would have been whatever David Fincher made him make. Uh, yeah, it was the Mysterium, the DSMC one Mysterium that when it went to the box instead of the tube. Okay, yeah, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. So I managed to chuck the limos on that and shoot a music video on that. That was fun, and it it worked worked well. Yeah. What uh, you got a master's in in cinematography? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I left New Zealand after being a second AC for probably five years because uh, I got into the AFTRS, which is the National Film School in Sydney, and um, they only took four people a year, which is kind of cool that I got. Oh wow! And then. Yeah, I even ended up on the news in New Zealand. Oh, how cool it was. <laughs> I was shooting my first music video and they came along and interviewed me about getting into that film school. It was, uh, it was great. Yeah, I went to that for two years as full-time course um, and then left with a MA. doesn't really matter having an MA other than when you try and get your visa for shooting in America. Or sure. Like that. That's actually not. That's actually a better question than does film school matter now? Because I was thinking about it when you're talking about like having a niche or whatever. I've interviewed a few DPs and directors. Actually, I interviewed, um, crap, what's his name? The um, production designer for, uh, he was a production designer in Lord of the Rings, which I know you were a part yeah, of. Yeah, I was the vaguely. main, I was the main you know, on that second I see. Um, crap. Was this Dan? Dan, um, no. Absolutely. This is gonna be, he he also did power the dog. Um uh, that that makes me feel bad. Oh, you said power of the dog. I thought you said he powered the dog. Oh no, 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 yeah, yeah. The movie Power of the Dog. Um never ending story, isn't it? <laughs> uh but something that I was kind of talking to all these various people about was from your perspective, is it easier to be a DP in terms of getting jobs, you know, moving up the ranks or whatever in Australia and, and New Zealand than uh, America, or is it kind of just a smaller version of the same thing? That's a good question, bro. Because um, after finishing film school, I, I worked for quite a while as a you know working on music videos and ads, and slowly working my way up. Um, and I, I think if you don't crack it really hard straight away, a lot of people kind of remember you as the guy who left film school and was slowly working his way up, and then. It's quite difficult to actually really crack it and start doing the big jobs, of which there aren't many in Sydney or went back then. There were kind of maybe three or four DPs that were doing all the big jobs and everything else kind of dropped down. Um, and after I left um, Sydney and moved to London is really when my career took off because I think no one really knew me. Uh, I had a couple of car commercials and then I managed to get a, a, a pretty good cut our commercial with the Bridgestone tires uh, straight away and that took off and that was amazing. So uh, it's a tricky one to answer. It depends like how, how ballsy and how cocky you are, I think. But I, I wasn't really too ballsy or cocky. I just bruised along and enjoyed life maybe too much. Yeah, I, I certainly took that route. But yeah, uh, after I left college, I was working at Red Bull and I was like, I'm going to live forever. And then, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> totally. Oh man, I had a meeting with a financial advisor last week and I, God, I wish I'd had that meeting when I was 20, but hey, it's what it is, bro. Yeah. Does, uh, how did you end up getting those first jobs? Was it just because you had worked on larger sets and it was kind of a word of mouth thing or were you, did you pivot to your, you know, were you advertising yourself as a DP at this point? Uh, I was advertising myself as a DP. They don't have agents in Australia. They've set booking services. So you'd come up as available, um, that then look at your website or your CV. Um, it was it's, it's a bit of word of mouth, I suppose, and just who you've been working with. I was kind of do. I was pretty much shooting anything I could: commercials, music videos. Um, did it? Yeah, pretty much anything. It's. Uh, I don't know. I'm not really sure how to answer that one. Yeah. Sorry, mate. Well, I don't know. Where's the because the a lot of DPs seem to have come up and directors for that matter, seem to have come up in like the music video scene and become, yeah. you know, your Spike Jones, your David Fincher, you know, whoever. Yeah. And, uh, Romanek. And it doesn't feel like that world really exists. And we're like, there's probably a couple legit music videos that you could be like, look, I, you know, I shot that and, and you should give yeah. me a job versus now it's usually like your friend's band. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you, you, you definitely keep chipping away. And like, everything is always leads to something else as long as you don't cause a massive like, world of pain on set. And I'm generally a pretty nice guy. Worked pretty hard and did, did my best. But, I mean, it, like every, everything through my career has always been like a, a little jump here and a little jump there. Like when I, um, I got into uh, film school, when I got uh, Lord of the Rings, and then um, when I got my first car commercial, like, Every the first car commercial I had was a was supposed to be a documentary, and then it turned into a full blown production Russian arm shooting in the desert outside of LA, and I was like, and then would go to China and finish it off as for Chevrolet. And I was like, oh, they're definitely going to kick me off, and they kept me on. So then, then you have a car commercial, and then suddenly you're allowed to do car commercials after that. You know what I mean? Right. But uh, uh, but for instance, I was in Sydney. Uh, and uh, Vaughn Arnell, who's an English uh, director, famous music video director, came over and he chose me to do a One Direction video there. And that was that was pretty big. I think the budget was about a million, and that just doesn't happen in Sydney. So then I had done a really good music video as well. You know, so yeah. you just keep on and it'll come to you. Keep smiling. Yeah, it is. It is kind of annoying how you have to uh, get the job to get a job. Oh, totally. Like, <laughs> yeah. I want to shoot car commercials like what you haven't. And you're like, yes. Yeah, I know. I would man. like to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, I lost a commercial once because they, they were carrying a cooked chicken through the background of the shot. And uh, apparently, I, and they wanted to know if I'd shot something before. And I said, I haven't. And so they kicked me off and got someone else. Oh, my good God. And that. Uh, it made, that smells fishy to me, eh, bro? It must have been something else, but I like to think that was why. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it doesn't sound... I've heard stupider. It's ridiculous, eh? <laughs> That's the kind of thing I do miss about shooting commercials. I haven't shot a commercial for a while. It's just the the craziness of what goes on. I used to just sit there and love it, to be honest. Just listen. Yeah. Well, they're so educational, too. Like, you do so many that you, you get a lot of reps in. Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, yeah, I learned a lot about backing cleaners for a little while. I'm still, you know, electric back cleaners. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Did a lot of baby stuff. I learned about babies. Didn't help when I had a baby, but yeah. You, know. <laughs> you knew what products to get. I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, what, uh, what was your experience like working on that, the Lord of the Rings trilogy? Were you, um, learning a ton on that or were you just kind of doing your job, keeping your head down? Because I assume, uh, at the time, did anyone know that was going to blow up like it did, or was it kind of just like put your head down and work? I was at the right time at the right place. I'd been second ace thing for only for about a year and a half, and not on big stuff like you know sixteen mil commercials, local content, like nothing, nothing even close to that. I think I'd worked on a TV series with, uh, with William Shatner in it, but other than that, it was nothing going on. Um, and I, I got a phone call one day and got asked if I would be interested in working on the main unit of Lord of the Rings. And we'd heard about it coming. Not everyone knew how big it was. We kind of had an idea that it was going to be pretty big because it was um, Peter Jackson and he had just finished The Frighteners and we, everyone thought that was big because it had Michael J. Fox in it. Right. Um, but it, it, I really had no idea what I was walking into. I was 18 at the time. I remember turning up on day one um, to the camera prep room and I'd never seen so many boxes in my life. I had no idea what the hell was going on because it was enough kit for three units. I think, um, I had 48 mags in the truck and six different stocks. Oof. Uh, it, bro, it was, it was insane. And also, uh, I was supposed to be the truck loader, but, uh, Jack Fitzgerald, um, got pulled into focus pulling the third camera. Uh, so I was doing everything. The sheets, slates, loading. Yeah, it was nuts. Absolutely mental. I wish I'd had a bit more time to chill and kind of watch what was going on, but I, I just did. I just did it, man. It was, uh, it was insanity plus for, um, for a long, long time. Well, it, it's funny because I'm not a big Lord of the Rings fan. I've, what's all right? This is gonna piss somebody off. I've watched, I've watched all whatever it is, fifteen hours of this special uh of the documentary you know that comes on the extended dvds oh yeah and i have probably not... and a lot then but yeah maybe i should yeah we should go back and check yeah, it yeah um but i have not seen the first two films <laughs> you, you what you, i i yeah. have not seen the first two films i've seen the entire making of documentary and i've seen the third one 
Ah, cool. Well, I've seen I have finished it. But, um, I just yeah. saw that one in theaters. I hadn't seen yeah, the first two. Fun. And my friends were like, hey, let's go. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Did you notice that right at the end when they come back to Hobbiton that um, Elijah looked really young again? <laughs> no, I mean, it's been whatever, you know, like 20 years, but uh, did they shoot yeah. that first? Yeah. So, well, not, well, it was early on. We're in Hobbiton um, and we shot them at the beginning of the book one and, and also their return. So, yeah, we shot it all together for one and three, which I don't think had been done before. If it had, I didn't know about it. I can't, I remember that being a thing. Like, I remember them advertising, like, oh my God, they're shooting all three at once. Yeah. Everyone thought everyone was completely mental that was worth on it, but it sort of turned out and now it's kind of a, a thing, right? Yeah. Well, and, and what I was going to say initially before I uh, showed my ass to however many people listen to this, uh, I, the, uh, I, the, uh, it does feel like everyone who made that film, it, it seemed from the outside, like it was an indie project that, yeah. the, that an entire nation worked on. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I think it's about 2000 cast and crew that worked on it and that, like nothing like that had ever happened in New Zealand. And it, it kind of definitely was the, I'd say the second birth of the New Zealand film industry. Um, it was it was epic. I remember being at the um, at the rap party, and I went to the toilet, and the guy next to me, I was I had never seen him. I go, "Hey man, what did what are you doing with the show?" And he was the guy that looked after the portaloos. <laughs> so, yeah, it was uh, it was the cool. Yeah, it was it was it, it, it was absolutely amazing to work on it. And I've got actually right next to me is a poster. It was. Um, uh, from the original uh, poster that came out before they put all the text down the bottom and I managed to sneak one. Oh, that's so, awesome, actually. Yeah, I got Elijah to sign it for me. I was kind of, yeah, I was kind of, oh, yeah, I did want him to sign it. Oh, yeah, but, I mean, he signed it, but he also wrote like, like a lovely message to me on it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's cool. I'll read it to it. It says, Callan, it was a brilliant journey. All of us are bonded for life. Yeah, it's to the bloody ring. Elijah. That's rad. Yeah, man. He's a good dude. Also, that artwork is sick. Oh, Just yeah. Just as a poster, that's a great poster. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really cool. It's got a kink in it, though, because I didn't fold it up probably when I put it back in the car. But, and, yeah, whatever. That's, you know, that's just part of the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. What, uh, so you, from there, you kind of, some time passes. I saw a ton of um, second unit work on your website. And yeah, uh, honestly, I think second unit is more fun. Oh, it, it definitely can be. Um, it's or at least more interesting. On the big films, I, I would say it's definitely more fun, for sure. Um, so I, I was working on a, a Mercedes commercial with Mark Forster, uh, um, and he was about to start doing Christopher Robin, and he asked me um, if I wanted to do Splinter Unit on that. So that was my kind of foray into, back into film and TV. So I did that. And then, uh, then I got asked to do Fast Nine with Steve Winden, and that that really was it. That was the clincher. So that was like five months' work on a huge film. I think we had three cameras full time with four camera packages, and uh, we took over Edinburgh for about two months. <laughs> it was weird. yeah, um, and we definitely had a lot of fun on that. Yeah. So while Steve was in the studio shooting all the chat, we were blowing stuff up and smashing drones into buildings and. Yeah, some cool stuff. It is because it's, I feel like the thing that you don't recognize getting, you know, trying to pursue a career in cinematography is that all the fun shit that you love as a kid. Yeah. That's second unit. <laughs> yeah. Done by Everything you, that makes you want to do this is second unit. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh man, we have fun. Like when we threw the uh, car through the whiskey shop, that was, that was amazing. Uh, we took quite a few guys at doing that. It was an expensive shop. Yeah. Look, <laughs> yeah. What? Then, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, then after that, I got, uh, went on to um, Masters of the Air, second unit. So that was absolutely amazing because I'm super into um, history. And I'd actually just read the book. Uh, well, not read it. I'd listen to it. I really read much. Good. I think it counts. I think it counts. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not a pedant like that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but that was cool. And we did some awesome stuff on that. We killed a killed a lot of young Americans. Yeah. <laughs> that show is incredible, by the way. Like wicked, eh? Uh, yeah. Congrats on that one. Uh, oh, 
what are the legi- was that um what were most of your shots for second unit on masters of air i was mainly in the volume unit doing um mm-hmm. like when anything went wrong inside the b17 so it was generally uh myself in the unit that we, that i was working there mm-hmm. um lee morrison was my director he was the stunt coordinator um and we also did what's called a rotisserie where we're outside and it would it could spin 360 and also come up on its on its uh on its end and not like some air ground ride um that was really hard to shoot and i don't operate i did, i wasn't operating operating on those jobs so i just send the guys in and yeah. <laughs> sit there and watch it yeah, yeah. Did, had you worked on a volume before uh, I did a couple of times, um, I think a music video and a car commercial. Um, but this was definitely the biggest volume I'd ever seen. There were two volumes. One was kind of like a um, concave, but kind of long and concave. So you could shoot the, uh, B-17 in profile. It didn't mm. quite, the fuselage didn't quite fit. We either had to have the front on it or the, or the tail on it, uh, cockpit or tail. Uh, and then we had a separate, um, uh, gimbal rig just for the cockpit and uh, that was like enclosed in volume and that's where all the all the pilot piloting of the planes was shot yeah do you it's you know there's a lot of like just in general not even in film there's just so many new technologies that come out and everyone you know like fucking bitcoin crypto is going to change the world and then it does for 10 minutes and then everyone yeah yeah yeah. do you do you see the volume is something that like because it's a tricky thing like just in it, logistically it really is man and and there's and look there's probably there's going to be people that are listening to, your, to this that have done like heaps of it and they know it inside out but it really is a bit of a beat that you need to know how to tame and how to use it properly and what what it works for and when it doesn't work um like uh, i was i was in the volume stage yesterday uh shooting gangs of london uh with cars and I've since realized that tinting on windows in new cars is a freaking disaster if you have more than two people in a car. So it's something I didn't pay enough attention to at the beginning. And I really wish I had because it was just too late by the time it got into it. You just cannot make that look good. Because it's the it's that uh if I'm correct, it's that like well. Oh the oh that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like probably five stops of light you'd lose. And when you're in a volume stage, I don't generally use the volume to completely light what I'm doing. I, I use it for effects and a bit of a bit of ambience, but it is just impossible if you're shooting something in the back of a car and you want a full shot or something looking in there. But, and what was, would it have just been too difficult to roll the windows down and put it in later? Uh, look, that is a good question. Probably could have is something that was brought up, and I thought we're already down walking down this road. I think we should just crack on. I mean, sure. it's when I say it doesn't look great, it doesn't mean it looked horrible. It's just I'm pretty anal about making things look good. You know, yeah. it's a lot easier when you have a car that isn't tinted. I'll tell you that. Well, and initially when you said the tint, I I just immediately thought you meant like green magenta. Like there was like a film, oh, yeah. not like literal privacy tinting. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, the privacy tinting, and it was like really great as well. So it was a nightmare. We're putting lights through it, we're adding magenta to those lights. And then, uh, God. But also, they had to get in and out of the car as well. So that was a Right. Yeah. Well, and when the, I remember when the Mandalorian first came out and everyone was like, this is the future. And they were like, yeah, I remember a bunch of people going like, you don't have to light. And I was like, what are yeah. you talking about? They're like, it'll do it. I'm like, it's not bright enough. Have you been lit by a screen before? Like, Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think it definitely matters on the, on the size of the screen. And also if it's a day or night shot and what's going on in like in the volume. But, um, I, I, I was adding quite a bit of light to these car scenes in the last few days. And uh, I was really happy with how it turned out, but finding that happy medium of interactive light and still being able to see them enough to be able to, you know, pull their skin tone out and their eyes are lit. And yeah, yeah. Well, on, on, on masters of the air, we were, we were lighting inside the plane seats and from outside and yeah. Did you, uh, um, on the crane. Sorry. Say again? Oh, we had a sun on a crane, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Nine K being the sun, all of that. You need to have a lot of interactive lighting really of your own too. Totally. Were you doing any like um, 
because I know, uh, I, who was I talking to that was shooting on like one of the, oh, I think it was the DP from the Mandalorian, but he was saying that they, um, they would just put like sometimes just a white square, like, yeah, uh, like yeah, a yeah. digital white square, just somewhere in the volume to get oh, yeah. some. No, it, it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah it's, and lots of people don't know you can do that stuff. You can create all, all, create all kinds of shapes and you can make them uh, strobe or you can make them pulse or. So yesterday I had a, uh, a massive rectangle in between the top of the windscreen and the roof of the car and mm. um, just added like the sun pulsing through the trees. It just, it, it's cool. You definitely, you need the, um, you need the person operating the volume to be as onto it as they can be really. Cause if they're not, they're going to take too long or they're going to do it wrong. Or... So it's kind of like being in a, in a uh, tracking vehicle. You need everyone to be in, you know, cohesion. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, that works. Yeah. Kind of sounds smart. I dog, I do it all day. Just trying, good, bro. just trying. <laughs> um does it does it end up being not like with specific numbers, but does it end up being cheaper overall or is it more just a workflow consideration that it makes it easier in some way or it, uh, besides just going out and driving around, you know? Yeah, I'd say it's definitely uh wow, is it a, Depends on where you shoot. I mean, some volume stages are so expensive, but it's definitely uh, better than uh, than on a low loader driving around in all kinds of weather conditions with the sun changing direction every time and around and uh, having to get traffic control and um, all of that. I mean, it's not fast. This is the thing that people need to know. They think, oh, we're in the volume state. It's all good. Just rock out. Turn it on. You need a prep day. You need to go through everything. You need to settle your lighting. You need a great board operator uh, and an volume operator. Um, but I would say yes. We went through probably five pages of stuff in four different cars yesterday and one day. Oh, and really? That way you're never going to do that on a on a low loader. Yeah. So so longer prep, but more time shooting versus yeah. long yeah. day, less time shooting. <laughs> Yeah, 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 no, exactly. And it, it does look better once you get it right. It definitely looks better. Unless you've got product faster. The, um, where was my, oh, I did, before getting into uh, the gentleman, uh, yeah. which is sick, by the way, um, I I had to ask, New Zealand's worst commercial? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what was the worst commercial ever made? That you were. Oh, man, that's not the worst ever. I think it was the worst in. Uh, uh, when was it? That it would have been 1993. Yeah. Uh, they, they, in New Zealand, there's this show called Fair Go, and they used to have a, a, a like a, a, sh a show every year where they have like New Zealand's worst commercial, and like guess through all of them. And I was in it. It was. Uh, my brother used to do quite a bit of acting. This is kind of how I partly got into the film industry. I'd already um, found a love of photography after my mum bought me a little second-hand camera sure. um and my brother used to do a bit of acting and i thought oh, that'd be cool i'll give that a go and i managed to score a, a commercial and uh it was a sanitarium peanut butter commercial and i don't know if you have sanitarium but it's like new zealand's most famous peanut butter and the ads used to be pretty cheesy and i was a uh, jeff <laughs> yeah jeff jeff is awesome and um uh i was uh I was playing a character, uh, a kid walking around on a golf course driving range, picking up golf balls and getting hit in the head uh, with the helmet on. And um, because of such a hard day that I had, I needed to sit down and eat a uh, peanut butter sandwich at the end of it. Right. But yeah, it was uh, on that job. I got to see a real film camera. It was a Arri BL, 1,000 foot mag, 18 to 100 century zoom and a 6x6 six six map box. And I thought, wow, that is awesome. And yeah. the guy, the, the guy, that was so cool. The guy standing next to the camera, which I think was a grip. I asked him, how do you get into the film industry? And he, his answer was a lot of hard work, mate. Yeah. yeah. And so that was when it started. What made it the worst commercial though? Uh, it was just a shit script, I think. And I mean, I thought, oh, guys, okay. Eve walking around, picking up golf balls, getting hit in the head and sit down after a hard day and eat a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> After a hard day of getting hit in the head with a golf ball, it's time for some yeah. Yep, she's a hard life, mate. Someone's gonna do it. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it because it was just like a byline on something, and I was just like, uh, yeah. was it just shot shit? But yeah, that that is a pretty yeah, it looked good. I think for the for the time, yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> so with the with the gentleman, you did the last four episodes? Correct. Yeah, I did episode five through to eight. And Guy Ritchie directed the first two. Yeah. Of the whole right. thing. Yeah. And Ed Wild was the uh lead DP on one and two. So what was the conversation between it it does feel like whenever there's a, a project helmed by kind of a known director that's yeah. a series, it does end up usually being, it seems, the first couple episodes set the tone. Yeah. And then uh, uh absolutely. So what were the conversations like when when they were set were they setting up the look without you and then you were fulfilling it or were oh, yeah. you involved in those early conversations um, or uh Aaron and uh Aaron came on to the job only I think a week or two before I did. Aaron Craig mm-hmm. being the director lot three. So episode five and six. Um and so he was as new to it as I was really. So uh with himself and uh, Laura Jackson, our block producer, we were luckily able to watch uh, episode one or a, a, an early cut of it anyway. So we got to check that out and I was like, holy shit, this is so fucking good. Yeah. And uh, uh, and then we're like, after going, wow, this is amazing. We were working on such a cool show. We then went, ah, oh, shit, we've got to do as good as that. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, fuck. I'm sorry if I'm not allowed to swear. No, you're good. Uh, you can say the fuck word here. <laughs> okay. Cool, man. Um, yeah, so we watched that. Uh, Ed had also um, drawn up like a, a, a couple of pages of PDF of what guy really likes, kind of angles that he's into. Generally, it was what not to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's your kind of base plan to stick with. Uh, uh, that makes my notes far more interesting. What are you not supposed to do on a Guy Ritchie project? Oh, well, uh, I, I mean, for instance, he doesn't like uh, direct over shoulders. So he likes to be back a bit further or be a clean single. Mm. Uh, his files, he wants to see one eye, not two or three quarters of an eye or anything like that. And uh, it was it was generally just a look for this show. I wouldn't say it's, I couldn't tell you if it's in general what he likes or doesn't like, but mm. it was more of a base look for that. Well, because as I was uh, watching it, I noticed there were some, I guess what I didn't, well, when I think of Guy Ritchie, I primarily think dialogue, but since I was watching it, yeah. you know, trying to see it, there were some Ritchie-isms, you know, like your, your random slow-mos, uh, yeah. you know, uh, we attached on cameras to shit, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, we put cameras on all kinds of stuff. It was great. FX3 was brilliant for that. Oh, did you shoot FX3 on this? No, I was shot, uh, Sony Venice. Uh, and Takina, the primes actually. Uh, Those are amazing lenses. They're really good, especially for the price. I think um, I think Ed underset. He's a very smart man. And um, heavy we uh, Yeah, pretty. Yep, yeah, yeah. They're kind of like master primes, aren't they? Yeah. And uh, we chucked a uh, black uh, satin, half black satin filter on it, which worked well until you had like exposed bulbs and stuff like that. That hal- the halation was too much, so. You knock it down to a quarter, or just take it out. Yeah, the uh, I was talking to Eric Messerschmidt about Ferrari, but also the Killer. And mm-hmm. uh, on the Killer, he said they used this program called Scatter, okay. which which is a diffusion plugin for Resolve. On that way, and so I reached out to him because you know it's kind of expensive, and I was like, "Can I write an article about this?" Because uh, on a good day, I'm a journalist, and yeah, and uh, they were like, "Yeah, here, here's a year." Uh, subscription whatever you know here's a year and i'm telling you man it's because i i hate that too when you have like a a strong light or you're getting something from the side or or a bulb in the frame and now it's like way too aggressive yeah 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 yeah. with scatter you can literally just you know i to you pick any filter they look exactly correct i mean it's it's so close um so you pick what filtration you want what strength but also if you want you just key out Something you could put like a area, yeah, just key out the area or put like a different strength in just that area or what you know, whatever you want because it's a resolve plugin. Oh, mate, that's wicked. I suppose you'd, you'd kind of want to be able to test it on set. I suppose, how would you do that? Just shoot it because you're not shooting filtration, just take any footage uh, or yeah, you know, sure. shoot regular tests and then just put it, drop it in. <laughs> so, yeah, that's cool. just tell me that. Can it, can it do this? There's uh, you know, a can it work on a on a location where you're not allowed to use haze, but you really want to use haze? Because I know they've got the smoke, smoke, smoke filters or whatever. Well, the smoke filters are in there. Yeah. They work all right. 
right? They're not, they're not the same in LA, but yeah. can it do that? It can. I mean, it, it can't fake haze. It's literally just a filtration emulation. Oh, right, right. But, um, you know, there is a, this is going to get nerdy. There is a depth map um, effect, basically, in Resolve that I've started using a lot um, for, instead of setting windows, you know, which sometimes you get that halo or you, you can't get pull like a good key on someone's face or whatever. Yeah. So there's a depth map option yeah. that you drop in and it creates some, I don't know how it reads it, some signs and uh, it it creates a, essentially a perfect key because the subject, unless the subject's somewhere else, but like usually the subject's right up front. So you just drop the depth map in and then you can affect, you know, whatever's closest gets the effect or whatever coloring or lighting, whatever you're doing and whatever drop falls yeah. off is more natural. But I suppose you could invert it and drop the smoke filter from scatter just only in the background. Oh man. And that might be like a haze thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds wicked. I like it. Well, now they better give me two years for free. Uh <laughs> totally. we we little 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 there, bro. Yeah. I deserve it. Um <laughs> but yeah, so like we're going back to the idea of like the types of shots you attaching things to people, the the slow mo shots, a lot of movement uh as well, yeah. you know. Yeah, we wanted to, well, there's always going to be the not to sort of guys sort of crime genre style. I mean, you can get away with so much too, because you just have such a, such an awesome base for what you want to be able to do. Um, we, we definitely want to move the camera around a lot. Uh, I think like, um, there's one scene in the boxing ring in Susie Glass's gym where on paper, it just read Susie and Eddie are watching a boxing match between her brother and she's really excited yeah if, you know we got the phantom camera out and then we pulled off the guy when he when he when he hit the canvas and we went straight into the face and there's actually a lot of stuff that we did that got cut out because it was too guy richie i think he didn't like it uh, oh it became a little pastiche i suppose so yeah maybe but we had a lot of fun doing it so you know it was cool is that that's the scene with guz khan right Oh my god, that guy is so cool! Yeah, like us, you know, when uh, when Guz gets punched by um, by uh, Susie's brother, um, yeah, what's his name? The other yeah, Glass, the other Glass, Jack Glass. Uh, yeah, where uh, Guz gets hit and he falls backwards, and then the music kicks in, and it's kind of like yeah, forty eight frames. That was a lot of fun to shoot. Yeah. Also, I I only knew that guy because of um, Taskmaster. I don't know if you ever watched Taskmaster, but I haven't. No, but I'm a oh. huge fan of Guz now, man. I'll tell you that after working with him. You can look up the U. There's Taskmaster. There's a Taskmaster in New Zealand, so you've got a local one. But the UK okay. one is like the original. It's literally just a uh, like five comedians or actors or whoever, and they have to just do tasks. Like that's the yeah. game for points that don't oh, matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, yeah, the tasks are absurd. It's so fucking <laughs> funny, dude. Um, but, uh, yeah, but that is another, that, that kind of 48 frame fall down, definitely another Richieism, as it were. Yeah. It was a lot of fun that, yeah, we had to, we actually had to shoot it out another day cause they had to build the rig and we had to move on to another set. So we came back for that. But it was, um, I'm glad we did it cause it almost got scrapped just for time. Yeah. Did you end up, I, cause like there's one shot in a caravan that's very snatch. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, oh, when um, the daytime scene where they're all sitting around. Yeah, 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 that was fun. Was that an objective reference, or did that just happen to kind of? I think that was pretty much written into the script that they're all sitting there, and then they'll adjust the position of um, Eddie and um, and Susie sitting at one end, and then all the family at the other. Yeah. But um, I'll tell you what, man, shooting in travelers' caravans is probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Really. It's well, we, they're, they're kind of one of a kind. We couldn't cut them up. Uh, there's mirrors absolutely everywhere. They're not that big, and they're also covered in plastic. So where it's not mirrors, it's shiny bits. Right. And, uh, and then you chuck about 13 people in there, and there's nowhere to put a camera. But uh, we got through it. But the night scene uh, in the Traveler's Caravan the first time where, he, um, where Eddie has an argument with the, uh, the head of the Traveler's, that was, that was really hard, and that was night one for me shooting sweet straight into the fire what was what was the kind of because the show is incredibly 
I have to, I have to always think about when people shoot in the UK because I'm always like, oh, the lighting is so even. It's like, no, it's just overcast all the time. Yeah. Um, that's not a choice. But <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it's definitely not as sunny as some places. That's for sure. It feels like it's been raining for about six six years at the moment. But um, yeah, well, I mean, we got smashed by the weather. To be honest, we had all kinds of stuff going on, and we just we pretty much just had to roll with whatever we got. We woke up, I think, on the fourth morning. Uh, we were supposed to shoot the traveler's arrival, uh, and it had snowed really heavily overnight and no one had, had, um, seen it coming either. It wasn't even on the weather report. Um, like it was a good few inches. So everything. You look at the call sheet, like, is this the right day? <laughs> yeah. The call sheet was fucking covered in snow. It was, um, yeah. So we, uh, had a bit of an emergency meeting at breakfast and then, uh, decided to crack on and we managed to shoot the opening to Epps. Or that it's probably seen fall now. It used to be that thing, but when Eddie's just standing there looking out of the house dead manner to, towards the snow, but uh, that that worked really well. Yeah. What was the kind of, I suppose, general lighting approach? Because it does feel kind of like a your classic, you know, soft key, but um, yeah, kind of thing. But it but it it feels like you were probably pretty nimble with everything. Or is that just an illusion and you had to use a ton of lights? Uh, a bit of both, because a lot of the times we were shooting in pretty big rooms, you know, um, yeah. like the it's way to Halstead Manor is huge. Yeah. Like I was certainly had, um, would either have a couple of 18s on a, um, on a machine outside or what I preferred, uh, was about when you teach all vortexes. They I love the vortexes. I got one behind this door. Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah. I mean, it gives you such a nice look and if you can get them close enough, it just looks brilliant. And then obviously you can adjust whatever you want. And also then you can chuck it up for a moonlight when you go outside, do your, do your night stuff. Um, but generally we'd have big soft key, uh, passive sort of front bill, and then a bit of a sidey light and a, a bit of a backlight sometimes. Eddie, um, Theo, James is actually quite tricky to light. His eyes are quite deep set, mm. uh, in his head. Good looking guy, but he's quite hard to light. And uh, he knows it too. And he'll come and tell you early on. And you go like, you know, just keep an eye on my eyes, bro. I think he gets annoyed if uh, you can't see his eyes. Fair enough. Um, so yeah, it took a couple of days to figure that one out as well. But he probably using... gets notes. <laughs> hey, can you look up more? Can you look up more? Yeah. I mean, he, he, he quite enjoys coming and watching, uh, watching the take afterwards, to be honest. And mm. he'll ask for one if he feels he needs it. Yeah. Was the key there just to get things angled correctly or were you employing like an eye light in general? Um, sorry, what's the question? Do you like for situations like that? Did you, is it just about like angling the light correctly or, or were you employing a specific eye light? Um, would generally have a, a light a bit close to the camera that I normally wouldn't a little bit lower. Um, so we were using the Cineos, uh, which are like the, uh, um, weatherproof versions of the 360, but they're not made by Ari. Right. Uh, so we'd have that pretty much just off camera and then sometimes through a, like an eight by T bar and that seemed to do it. That was, that, that worked well. Uh, would have uh, for the night stuff. Sometimes we'd have a big uh, gem ball or something like that. Susie, um, Kaya's, uh, skin, and uh, face really lit up when you chucked the gem ball on it. Look amazing. Yeah. It was, a, it was quite light. Uh, this comes up on every single interview, so I'm going to bring it up. And they actually are my friends. Did you end up using a stereo tubes? Uh, yeah, we did, but, uh, <laughs> there they are. <laughs> we did. Yeah, we did, bro. Um, we did, but, uh, d differently to what I had used them in the past, we'd use them with the snap bags. And then, mm -hmm. uh, after that, I think they started creating crates for the snap bags as well. So it'd be like a two foot soft box. Uh, or a four foot soft box. And I'd do that a lot. Sometimes we'd put two four foots together. Mm. Uh, and that would work really well. It still have, yeah, very handy, especially for highlights. And so you were using those primarily as keys or were you lighting the room with those? Um, generally wasn't lighting the room with those. We just went in spaces that would, uh, light a room with that kind of, yeah, that kind of lamp really would generally bigger, uh, from outside or just a bit bigger in general or bright lights. Uh, we well, use the next pole, the MYX poles. Oh, sure. Yeah. The aperture ones or whatever. Yeah. That's super handy. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. Th those bulbs and like the little MC pucks or like, you know, whatever the little magnetic. 
Oh uh, yeah, the, um, those things are rad. Is it Rusco today? To the little dash dots, and you've got the um, uh, the hydro panels. I have yeah. a literally. Ah, uh, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. That's a box of hydro panels right there. Really? Mate, yeah, yes. Yeah. A good, a good land, man. They are so good. Yeah, my board operator likes them a lot too because he says they're easier to um, connect or whatever they call it. Yeah. Well, and, and like the case charges them. You know, obviously you can use the iPad. To... Yeah, they're awesome. How are you using them primarily? Just for smaller spaces? Uh, smaller spaces, yeah. Or um, yeah, pretty much just small spaces. I've got a dash dot at home, and I've not been able to use it yet. The only time I've ever used it is when. Um, uh, we had someone come around and I turned it on to the police boat and I told him that the cops were there. Sure. You know what's funny is, so I, uh, there's a uh, camera supply store uh, called Film Tools over here. And yeah, yeah. they uh, had uh, just a bunch of lights out on the floor. And so one day I walked in there with my color meter and I just metered everything just to see like what lights are actually good. Like sky panels don't actually, I've said it a few times and I hope, Ari doesn't listen yeah. to that, but sky panels aren't like the, like Vortex is actually, Kino, Kino LEDs are by far the most accurate, beautiful. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that LED. the SL1 and the SL2? Is that, they are? is that the SL1 and SL2? No, it's the, the Freestyle, the Diva. Oh, okay. They're all exactly the same. Any of the Kino LEDs are really? the same. It's just different housings, basically. Oh, cool. It was so, good to like, I was still smashing it. I've always felt sad for all those Kino bulbs lying around, wherever they are. I had so like, many. Here, I don't know, maybe. They, you know what's nice, actually, is a few years ago, um, because I had a, a Diva kit. Uh, oh, the the initial point I was going to say was the Roscoe, actually, the the Dash, um, incredibly good output. I was surprised oh, at yeah. how, like, how smooth that um, spectral output is oh, and cool. how accurate yeah. it is. Um but what was nice was Kino um, it needs parts for those fluorescent fixtures to fix other like broken ones. And just they don't yeah. have any because they don't make them anymore. So yeah, they, yeah. they gave me like a 60% discount on the new LED panels if I would just trade in my old fluorescent no. ones because they needed them for parts and and I'm sitting there going like how much of this do you need and they're like you can take whatever you want out of that box because we just need really the parts and I was like amazing they're, they're like oh, best be, company be everywhere you think I'd just be sitting in a box somewhere and everyone was like lighting store or whatever I well that's the thing is I think there's a lot of rental houses that probably still have them but they're yeah. not gonna give them back you know yeah true. that yeah. what's happening is the rental houses are sending the fixtures into Kino to get fixed. So they need, yeah. they need mine to replace them basically. <laughs> right. That's wicked. Yeah. Jump on a band, try and buy some old Kino kit. Yeah. I th they did produce like a nice, a nice light. Yeah. I did like, I, we used it on Lord of the Rings a lot. That's for sure. Really? Yeah. I figured that would have just been all tungsten and all the time. No. Pretty sure we had, no, there's a lot of Kino. I remember the Diva light was used quite a bit to get under um, Ian McKellen's hat. Oh, well, sure, yeah, yeah. I might be wrong, bro, but I don't think I It was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, 22 years ago. Um, what kind of, when you were outside, you know, I noticed that obviously we were talking about um, the weather kind of screwing you guys up, but uh, that, oh, how do you shape overcast or do you even bother? Because there's like some direct sun stuff that looks kind of untouched as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you kind of got to, yeah. Look, I try and inside light or backlight when I can just to keep you out of the out of trouble, really, uh, for crane shutters or camera shutters or boom shutters. Mm. And um, so even if it's going to be overcast, I still plan it as if it's going to get sunny because you never know. Like, so it's going to pop open and if you're facing the wrong direction, you're in the shit. Um, to say that, yeah, I'll chuck in like a 12 or something like that. Just to get a, a bit of drop off on the on but the um on the by what negative what, oh sure what? yeah that's what I call it. you just yeah. dropped out for a second so I didn't hear <laughs> ah sorry yeah yeah so yeah I'd use like a twelve by negative or depending how big it can be if we're walking with it can be an eight by uh, eight by eight feet don't do it yeah when I was working in uh, China and asked for an eight by and they freaked out because they thought I wanted eight by eight meter oh yeah but it's, yeah no. Um, yeah, yeah, so you'd uh, pretty much do that. Just keep it pretty uh, pretty chill, really. Um, or we'd use those Cineos to add a little bit of highlight and just get in the eyes. 
drop a bit of white on the floor if you need to. Um, but generally on overcast day, you don't need to do too much. And even on overcast day, keeping it backlit, you still get a bit of backlight, you know. And, yeah. that's and just, you, I mean, you either see it or like, I guess the sun seeker. Yeah. Oops. Which, yeah, but it doesn't. And it was bloody lying to you. I don't, I don't trust mine too much anymore. I've always got to check with other people now. The uh, mine, because I have an Android, uh, I don't use Sunseeker, the app. It's like another version of it. And it always tells me it needs to like calibrate. Like yeah. you, you pointed to the sun and it just, it's just whipping around. I'm like, that doesn't. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, man, it's nothing worse setting up and then realizing that on the recce it was completely backwards. Oh, jeez, has that happened? Uh, well, no, I've got to the end of the recce and I had to go up to the director and go, on, "Hey, look, I'm I'm sorry, mate, but uh, yeah, that was completely wrong. What I told you, the sun's actually over there." Yeah, but now I, now I bring in the gaffer, and so at least I can share the responsibility of totally fucking it up. Yeah. How long was the shoot for the show? Was it a, a pretty compact schedule? For the gentleman, yeah, uh, I think it was about five weeks per at. I think it was, it was like twenty. That's not days. terrible. No, 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 it was good. Um, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I think I may have had slightly longer on um, on block one, but I'm pretty sure we. I think we got down to about twenty eight days on block four. Um, Still decent. Yeah, no, it was all right. Yeah, I think we're shooting sort of between three and five pages a day. Sometimes we'd go to six if we're in one space uh, or down to two if we're moving around. But um, it was generally between three and five. Yeah. What can, when having like a nice schedule that, like that, uh, does that afford you anything logistic? I mean, obviously not logistically like shooting, but like in your management style, like does, are you able to kind of, as David Lynch would say, like get dreamy with it and, and like think about stuff or is it kind of still get going just with but oh, you have more time definitely definitely still under the pump you know because like some people want more takes or um for whatever reason you get held up i mean three or five pages a day it's still pretty quick i think yeah um but also because it's got like that kind of style to it you do need to put an effort into shooting uh with a bit of emotional energy you can't just like smash it out i mean obviously we had to every now and again when we're totally running out of time but yeah we just it just it did allow us to give a little bit more energy into the the visual storytelling. Sure. Did uh, was there anything? Because I've started. I realized recently, and after 140 episodes of this thing, I yeah. n- I've never really gotten into the the management position of being a DP. It's always been lighting and cameras and whatnot. Oh really? Um, yeah. And it's just such an important part. And I'm like, that was a blind spot. I should have started this earlier. Uh, but I kind of wanted to know, uh, was there anything that you learned from any like mentors, anything that you've carried on to the way that you run a team or, uh, anything that maybe, uh, some advice yeah. you have for people? I think from, uh, being a camera assistant, the second I'd say was really just like work your butt off, keep your head down, uh, be nice to people. I think, uh, for DP wise, uh, Steve Winden was actually probably one of the biggest influences that I've worked with because he's just such a lovely guy. He's working on like Fast and Curious to nine or ten, and it's like you're out in the pub with him. You know, it's just such a good dude. Um, other than that, not really. I think just just in general, I seem to be a pretty happy go lucky kind of person. I just try and treat people with respect, and as long as you're trying your best, um, then I'm cool. You know, I'm happy. It's when people piss around and take, you know, joking around on their phone when they need to be doing something. Right. You know. Are you able to, are you in the position in your career where you're able to like bring your crew from set to set or is is it someone else making those decisions? No. Yeah. I was, uh, well, on Gangs of London, because I was the lead DP, I was able to pick my crew. And um, sadly, because of the, um, the strikes i had sort of the pick of london to be honest so um sure yeah we had an amazing crew on that uh but uh when you like when you're a block dp you don't really get too much say in your crew unless someone's late um or maybe your second unit dp you can have a bit of say in. But other than that you just sort of like, give them what you give them but i mean the crews here are awesome everyone's lovely you, you don't really get dicks anymore i've, I've noticed 
I, you know, I've, I've heard that, that, uh, that era of like stomping around angry, yeah. like DPs, producers, other crew, whatever is kind of dead. And I think it's cell phones, but we can film it now. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, I mean, it's the whole, an opticon effect. Yeah. 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 Oh man. Yeah. Those days are pretty much over. You still see it every now and again, but it's nowhere near as full on as it used to be. I remember. Now I've seen some seen some shit in like in the late nineties, early two thousands, but um it's all pretty chill now. Yeah. It's uh it is funny, like you know, the joke is always like, we're not carrying cancer here. Like why oh, yeah. why yeah. did uh, Yeah. It's it, I mean it's stressful, obviously, but it's well, I guess that's re- truly the answer is that most people don't have, especially back then, uh don't go to therapy. <laughs> and don't yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, therapy's a good thing, especially if you're in a you know, crazy position like, uh, you know, DP. Yeah. Um, what? Operating. Let's say again. Or focus pulling or operating or gaffing. I mean, the whole industry is pretty intense, really, isn't it? Focus pulling, especially. Like, everyone wants to shoot full frame at a 1.4. Yeah. <laughs> you're just like, yeah. Ah. Yeah, and never, ever, well, we certainly on the show I'm on at the moment, we're not uh, getting any rehearsals or almost never. Maybe 90% of the time we'll shoot the rehearsal. And it just makes me think of that cat. What is that, you know, that cat, the rehearsal cat? Rehearsal cat? Yeah, have you not heard of rehearsal cat? No. Oh, uh, maybe I have to send it to you. Oh, okay. Like a, like, yeah, thought it was well known. Maybe not. Oh, but maybe it's, a, I'm also like, admittedly ignorant about a lot of things so it, it could be popular and i just have no idea <laughs> wait um but yeah you can dm that to me uh well I, I see that we're going over i know it's later for you than me oh it's so good man so good um but so i'll let you go but definitely uh would love to have you back on talk about the new show and honestly probably get more into masters of air i like touched on it and then didn't even um oh yeah yeah but uh, uh I've been so lucky to work on such cool stuff recently, especially I've not been in TV drama for very long, you know, maybe four years. So it's been yeah. apps, amazing. And so it's been talking to you, mate. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Appreciate it, dude. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll stay in touch. I just added you on the old gram. So, uh, wicked. Yeah, cool. All right, man. Uh, take care and, and thanks again for hanging out. Thanks, Kenny. See you, mate. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. As this is an independent podcast, uh, you know we rely on support from listeners like you. So if you'd like to help, you can buy me a coffee by going to uh, frameandrefpod.com, and there's a little button to buy me a coffee. That's also where you can find video versions of this podcast or audio, depending on how you're doing it now. Thank you so much. See you next time.